Rob Zombie, born Rob Straker, would spend his formative years in Haverville, Massachusetts, a depressed industrial outpost that the singer described to the LA Times as, and I quote, a place where nothing ever happens. Some magazine voted it the number one worst place to live a few years ago. There was just nothing to do there except hang out in cemeteries. They had these old New England style graveyards and we just used to play around in those all the time. Zombie would be pretty antisocial as a kid, having different interests from his peers. Telling the Times, I grew up with really normal straight parents, but they let me and my brother do anything we wanted to. They took us to see A Clockwork Orange and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I remember seeing like Phantom of the Opera when I was five years old. Rob would spend eight hours a day watching television, and it soon became an obsession for the future musician, with him literally watching anything that was broadcast on TV, and he would soon memorize the TV schedule for the entire week. This eventually led him down the road of him making his own Super 8 films. Apart from television, Zombie would develop a taste for larger-than-life musical acts including Kiss, Blue Oyster Cult, and Alice Cooper. Couple this with his love of the DIY ethos of punk rock, and Rob had the basic blueprint for White Zombie. The band would form when bassist Sean Salt and frontman Rob Zombie both met while attending the Parsons School of Design. The band's first drummer was also a student at the same school. Esalt would reveal in the book Louder Than Hell, Rob and I were both oddballs. I think we were drawn to each other. We started the band within a month of meeting and basically lived together for seven years. We both had dyed black hair, he had a stencil Misfits leather jacket, and I had a bunch of animal bones tied onto a necklace. The pair would date, but break up during the early 90s, with Esalt telling the Chicago Tribune, the whole band and the business just got so much bigger than any relationship. The band would also have a variety of drummers during their time together, and they would find a guitarist named Jay. White Zombie would be the amalgamation of two music scenes, the noise rock scene of New York, which included bands like Sonic Youth, and the hardcore scene in DC, which included bands like Minor Threat, Bad Brains, and Dave Grohl's pre-Nirvana band Scream. To Rob, he had the goal of not only giving fans a spectacular music video for their songs, but also to be able to give fans an equally impressive live show, telling the times, when we started out the metal scene was like Twisted Sister and that kind of stuff. So the only place to start was the alternative scene, which I thought was so pretentious. The attitude of those bands was, we get on stage, make no effort whatsoever, be completely nondescript, and you guys in the audience are supposed to eat it up, you kids are supposed to just worship our feet. My feeling is, if you're expecting people to come and pay 20 bucks to see your show, you'd better look up from your shoes once in a while. I like to see a band that gets up there and works hard for my entertainment dollar. It would result in the band rigging their own pyro using items they bought from nearby industrial stores. Despite being hailed as an underground act in their early days, that wasn't the group's intention as Esalt told Greensboro.com, we were an underground band, but not by choice. With Rob adding, we've always been trying to sell out, it's just that no one's buying. It was during their early years that the members lived in New York's Lower East Side, where Rob and Esalt supported themselves doing mechanicals for a magazine, while guitarist Jay delivered pizzas, Sometimes with dangerous results telling Greensboro.com, I got robbed a couple times, one time with a knife to my throat, one time with a gun. The band would sign to label Caroline Records, who put out their first two records, 1987's Soul Crusher and 1989's Make Them Die Slowly. But the road to gain recognition was a long one. The band's first release seemed to go unnoticed or was misunderstood with the assault revealing in Louder Than Hell. When our first record Soul Crusher came out in 1987, people called us art, noise, psycho rock. We liked Black Sabbath and Black Flag, but we were also into the birthday party and we were trying to mix a lot of those things together. People didn't really get it. We would play a lot of those things together. We would play this really heavy music in clubs in the East Village and all these hipsters just stared at us and scratched their heads. The reviews would echo a similar sentiment, but it was the band's detractors that drove Rob and company to push forward. And while the sales didn't reflect what was soon to happen, the group's first album found an audience with some accomplished musicians, including Kurt Cobain, Iggy Pop, and Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth. White Zombie would build up a crowd of post-punk followers at venues, including CBGBs, and they soon started playing metal clubs, widening their audience. By the early 90s, they would nab a recording contract with major label Geffen Records, and the band would move out west to Los Angeles. Given the band's image, you would have expected drugs and alcohol to have been used by its members, but for the most part they were on the straight and narrow. With the popularity of alternative music and grunge, White Zombie would carve out its own niche, providing something different with Rob telling the LA Times, 
When grunge came on the scene, it sucked all the fun out of rock music. I mean, when you pay 25 bucks to see a show, do you want to see some artists whining about their problems or some crazy show that you'll be talking about for the next year? I see there's a whole new generation of kids that's been longing for this stuff. Kids come up to me all the time after shows to say thanks for not just standing there and staring at my feet. The recording of the band's third record, La Sexorcisto Devil Music Volume 1, would land the band in some trouble with their label Geffen. Guitarist Jay would tell the Morning Call newspaper, we never really thought about clearing all those samples. Geffen didn't expect us to be using all the samples, so they said go ahead and make the record you want to make. So we went hog wild and delivered the record to LA and they freaked. They had to get the rights to whatever we sampled. As it turned out, the only things we didn't keep were a Vincent Price quote and a Charles Manson quote. The group's first record for Geffen, which came out in March of 1992, would be a slow burn. Entertainment Weekly would publish an article in October of 1993 that highlighted that the album had only moved about 75,000 copies before one of the album's videos for Welcome to the Planet Mother Effers would be featured on MTV's hit show Beavis and Butthead. Rob would tell the publication, the record immediately started picking up in markets where we never played, like Wyoming and Missouri, places where Beavis and Butthead was the only thing happening, where it's just cows. It always seemed we needed something to give the album a kick in the butt, and I guess that was the thing. The help from Beavis and Butthead would push sales to 300,000 copies by the fall of 1993, according to the publication. The album would also be helped by the single Thunder Kiss 65, and by the end of the day, it would move 2 million copies. Despite the help from Beavis and Butthead, the band also resented some of the news coverage of the tie-in, with Rob telling Greensboro.com, it's a really cool thing and it helped, but it's turned into this thing where people think Beavis and Butthead invented the band. Each article downplays us more. They'd only sold 20 records before Beavis and Butthead, where we were actually around 300,000 and had sold out a headlining tour. Other press coverage of the band branded the group as an overnight success, with Rob telling the Baltimore Sun, I guess to mainstream press, it will always seem like overnight success because it's something they never paid any attention to. Anything that's even remotely in the world of heavy metal is very much ignored. Alternative acts will get a lot of press way before they're big, but metal bands always seem to have come out of nowhere. They're completely ignored, and the next thing you know, they're selling on Madison Square Garden, and you're like, who is this? The band's success, though, would take the members by surprise, as Rob would admit that the biggest expectations the members had when they first started out was to play venues like CBGB's. But not all of the press coverage showered the band with praise, as they soon were being accused of being devil worshippers, with Rob telling the Baltimore Sun, I don't even know how you could take it literally, but you can take devil music a couple ways. Rock and roll or whatever, heavy metal has always been devil music, and there's always going to be a little old lady pointing the finger. Being branded as devil worshippers would result in White Zombie being banned from performing in a few places, including Omaha, Nebraska, according to the Morning Call newspaper, with guitarist Jay telling the publication, there were a couple places we weren't supposed to play because some group or another was going to protest, so I don't know how they even found out about us. He would go on to reveal that some record stores initially refused to carry the group's major label debut, but they would essentially change their minds with him telling the paper, the almighty dollar went out, and once sales picked up, those chains knuckled under and decided to carry it. Plus, it's pretty obvious that we're just messing around. The tour for the group's major label debut would see them open for Megadeth, Pantera, Anthrax, Testament, and Danzig, to name a few. By 1994, White Zombie would head back into the studio, enlisting Pantera producer Terry Date, to make the album that would define their career. New drummer John Tempesta, formerly of Exodus and Testament, would also join them in the studio. The resulting record, Astro Creep 2000, Songs of Love, Destruction, and Other Synthetic Delusions of the Electric Head, would see the band wearing more industrial influences on their sleeves. The album would prove to be the commercial peak for the band's career, but their interpersonal relationships were coming apart. Rob would reveal in Louder Than Hell, when we recorded the last record, I don't think the four of us were in the studio at any point. I would ride on a separate bus at all times, separate dressing rooms. It was four people who didn't work at all. On the outside, it looked so effing great. On the inside, it sucked. Released at just the right time in 1995, grunge had largely died the year before. As Alice in Chains were limping along, Pearl Jam was embroiled in a fight with Ticketmaster, and Nirvana was done. The album would prove to be the biggest of the group's career, moving 3 million copies, thanks in large part to the smash hit More Human Than Human, which took home MTV's best hard rock video. The success of the group in the mid-90s took the band by surprise with Rob telling the Times, Our success right now is kind of surprising because it seems like anything that's hard or heavy has taken a nosedive this year. 
A lot of bands that were doing double platinum last year, anyone from Queensryche to Megadeth to the Black Crows, are trying to follow up those huge records now and it's just not happening. While the album proved to be a commercial and creative peak, it also was a sonic farewell for the band, as their tour for the album would be the last for White Zombie. The band would co-headline alongside Pantera, and two years later in 1998, Rob Zombie would release his first solo record, Hellbilly Deluxe, and many already saw the writing on the wall, which was only confirmed by an official announcement the same year that the band was breaking up. Shawnee Salt would reveal the straw that broke the camel's back in the book Louder Than Hell, saying, The end for White Zombie came because Rob wanted the band to be a little more techno. Rob can be really controlling. Whoever's on his team, it's them against the world. Once Jay and I didn't want to go along with him creatively, he kind of considered us against them. Rob, in a lot of the press interviews since the band's breakup, has talked about his career aspirations of being a director of horror films and wanting to pursue other business ventures, but he also chalked up the band's split to simply being bored. His manager Andy Gould at the time would tell the LA Times, It's like a marriage. Trying to keep two people together is a tough nut, but trying to keep four people together in extreme circumstances is very difficult. Rob has a very specific vision of what he wanted to do, and he felt it was time to do it. Rob would also take some parting shots at his bandmates telling the same publication. They wanted to be taken seriously as musicians. All of a sudden they wanted to be like Jeff Beck or Eric Clapton and I was like screw that. I mean why do I care what critics think of me? Everything I love has always been hated by the critics. In the same publication the Times would interview his former bandmates with the Salt calling Zombie's assertion and I quote a flat out lie adding Rob wanted to do his own thing and we were fine with it. He can tell people as many lies as he wants but would I be running around in a costume playing surf garage if I wanted to be taken seriously like Jeff Beck she would ask? Rob would announce his intentions to dissolve the band during a conference call with his bandmates. In the years that followed, Rob has pursued a solo career and become involved with projects outside of music, while the other members play in other bands. As to whether we'd see a reunion, Rob has been pretty adamant that a white zombie reunion isn't in the cards. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories, take care.